Welcome to The Jay Martin Show. If you're new to the channel, my name is Jay. I'm an investor looking for the smartest home for my cash. And if that sounds like you, then I think you're gonna like what we do here. Now, my guest today is Michael Gentile. He's a founding partner at Bastion Asset Management and a longtime commodity investor. Today, we begin this conversation talking about the key leading economic indicators that most investors are missing and what they mean about our near-term economic outlook. I know you're gonna enjoy this piece of content. And as always, if you like my style, I publish a weekly essay every Sunday to about 40,000 investors just like me. Hit that link beneath this video if you wanna check that out. Here's Michael Gentile, enjoy. This is Jay Martin. All right, here I am with Michael Gentile. It's great to have you back on the show. Thank you for making the time. Great to be there, Jay. Okay, so let's start here. If I am scrolling through Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Reuters, um, you know, a handful of mainstream news outlets these days, I see a lot of headlines that are applauding the success of the soft landing in the United States. Simultaneously, uh, in the month of August, I think there was a record set for bankruptcy filings uh, reported in the United States. There's a handful of other metrics we could look at from auto loan delinquencies to credit card application rejections, but it doesn't strike me as a soft landing that should be applauded. Um, how do you see it, Michael? Let's start there. It's funny, Jay. If, we, if you talked to me six months ago, let's say, or even four months ago, I mean, the consensus view is a, a recession is coming. It's going to be bad because rates rates went up so quickly. I mean, record speed went to 500 basis points from zero in record speed in the last 12 months. And so everyone saw the rates go up really quickly and said, okay, re a recession's coming. The yield curve got inverted. It's almost like the, the boy who cried wolf. Everyone got tired of waiting for this recession. It's the recession that never came. And so now people have really pivoted their views almost 180 degrees to, okay, recession's not coming. We're going to have a soft landing because we haven't seen one yet, right? And so in my office, often talk to my partners, we talk about the great consumer squeeze. Consumers just being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed and squeezed. You look at the, the place on the inflationary basket, whether it be food, oil prices at the pump, their mortgage payments. But rates went up quickly. And as you probably know, Jay, it's a bit of a lagged effect. So, so the rates go up quick, but your payments sort of ratchet up over time. Whether your mortgage is resetting or the inflationary basket or you erode your savings that you had post-COVID. So I'm in the camp of there's no chance we're getting a soft landing here. I think we're going to have a a recession or a hard landing at some point in 2024. And the reason why people are talking about soft landing scenarios is because it's taken a bit longer for this recession to play out. But just because it hasn't played out in, in speed and velocity yet does not mean it's not coming. And if you just look at the common sense, consumer 70% of the US economy, take your average consumer, just think logically about where he is or she is today versus 12 to 24 months ago, she's here, she's in a lot worse shape, right? I mean, just it's, it's factual to, you know, your, your incomes have not kept up with the cost of living. Your mortgages are getting reset. Uh, your job prospects are a little bit softer than they were before. Your savings are down. So you're, you know, if you own fixed income, your bonds are down. So you're, you're, you're feeling a lot less positive about life and a lot less likely to spend uh, going forward. And so therefore, I think that's really a precursor to a significant economic contraction in the months and, or potentially next year. You know, okay, so let me ask you this question, Michael, because I see it kind of two ways. Um, there's the projection of a recession whether a hard landing or a soft landing, as if that's something that might happen or probably will happen in the future. Simultaneously, I see a lot of what you just mentioned. I see consumers getting squeezed today. I saw them getting squeezed last month. Last month, US set a record for bankruptcy filings. Um, you know, there's a lot of data available today that would tell me this is a recession. Like, how is it not? And what needs to happen? But there's a decoupling between our lived experience and the economy and what the media tells us is going on. And I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. How do you make sense of that? Because you could look at a lot of metrics today. Some of them I mentioned, like auto loan delinquencies, um, you know, delayed mortgage payments, credit card application rejections, all this, the bankruptcy rate. You know, And you could say, yeah, those seem pretty recessionary to me. Are we not already in one? But it's almost like we're waiting for confirmation from the media to say, oh, yeah, now, we're, you know, and so how do you make sense of those two things occurring at the same time? It's funny, as you know, the recession data, the GDP data is typically three, three to four month lag, right? So we're, we're not gonna, we're probably very well might be in a recession or entering into kind of recessionary economic data. And we won't know it for several months, right? But you're right, if you think about it like rationally, just looking around you, last year we had in our investment firm, we had a big trade on experiences over goods. So yeah, you saw a big slowdown in, in consumer goods. Like the, you know, the COVID everybody's buying stuff because they're staying at home. The spending on goods decreased dramatically. You saw the retailers suffering from that, but you still saw travel and experiential experience restaurants still doing quite well. 
you know, you're yeah. seeing that air, airline ticket prices in the U.S. have fallen precipitously. Bookings for next quarter and the quarter out of the price. And you're seeing sales now for the first time on airline travel, right? That tells you that the experiential side of spending is also contracting. So if you have consumer good spending contracting and experiential spending contracting, and from a high level, as you say, you're just being squeezed from your disposable income perspective. Well, that's what that's what creates the recession. But we're not going to have that. The, the front page of the Wall Street Journal is not going to say we're in a recession until five or six months of recessionary type activity have occurred in the markets. I think we're right at the precipice of that, especially yeah. with the Fed, the Fed continuing to say they want to keep fighting the good fight and maintaining rates where they are. They're not quite sure if they've done enough. I mean, I laugh because I think we talked a few years ago, Jay, when I said they were asleep at the wheel when rates were zero and saying that inflation was way worse than they were saying, and they were completely oblivious to it. That now I think they're in the opposite position now. I think the economy, they've gone too far too fast. They move rates too high and the economy is decelerating in real time. And they're still talking about fighting uh, inflation, uh, inflation beasts that they probably already tamed with their rate increases, right? So they're they're always behind the ball, both the Fed, I think, and the economic data. But I yeah. think in real time, the economy is slowing. There's no doubt the economy is slowing. Is it in a technical recession yet in terms of economic GDP data? I don't know. But we're decelerating in real time. That's the most important thing for investors and for uh, uh, economists to focus on right now. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And you know, I I asked that question because I get asked that question a lot, right? Like, what's the probability that we end up in a recession? And I, I struggle with it because I'm like, what are you waiting for? Like affirmation from global news to tell you that yes, this is a, like, are you in a recession? That's a better question, right? What's your personal situation? You know, exactly. as, as an example, I was trying to buy a, a TRX, a Dodge Ram truck. It's like a, you know, like 12 months ago, I couldn't find one. Maybe 18 months ago, mm -hmm. I couldn't find one. I hit like seven, eight different dealerships within, you know, about 50 miles from where I live. And it was, I found one, right? And it was astronomically priced, all this stuff. I've had four of those dealerships call me in the last two weeks asking if I want to buy a TRX. Suddenly they've got them, right? And they're yeah. they're doing the proactive reach out. And, yeah. um, you know, I live in a town about an hour outside of Vancouver, British Columbia. And we're back in a place, I've seen this before, where dealerships from the city are calling me now asking if they can drive a truck up for me to look at, right? Drive it up an hour outside of town. See if I'll bite on this. Okay, so you mentioned some of the inflation numbers. You know, oil is creeping back up again. Um, you know, it's hard to imagine that as the price of oil goes up, every, the price of everything goes up. It's the number one input required for everything we consume and utilize. Um, talk to me about your 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 forecast for inflation numbers, general cost of living, and how the Fed rate may respond to that rate. Um, this morning we saw Canada Canadian uh, bank pause rates for the time being. Um, what do you make of that, Michael? Yeah, I think I think potentially, and I mean, you've heard my views on. I think we're going to see a recession or a major deceleration in economic economic activity in the quarters and, and years ahead here. Um, so what, what I think we're en potentially entering a, a even more dangerous period, Jay, which is a stagflationary environment, right? Because I think the inflationary forces are going to be hard to control. We've I'm a, I'm a big investor in commodities for twenty plus years. We're, we're dramatically underinvested in stuff that we need. So all the commodities that we need to, to fuel our, our plan and our economic growth are, are in short supply because of a massive underinvestment in CapEx in these, in these industries the last 10 to 20 years. So we're going to see, and oil is the top of that list, copper, other things we need to really drive the EV revolution. So we're going to see in, continued inflationary pressures that are going to be higher than, than typical in the economy. At the same time, because the consumer is being squeezed so hard, you're going to see decelerating economic activity. So that, that cocktail we haven't seen probably in 50 years uh, in our economy, which is a inflationary period that's hard to control. Where the Fed's hands are, are tied behind their back because they can't really raise rates as aggressively as they would like to tame the inflationary forces because they're going to kill the U.S. consumer and kill their own U.S. government at the same time. We can talk about that a little bit later. So that that's a period we're going to see. I think that's where you're going to see neg real rates have gone to about two two and a half percent, and that that to me is way way too high. We had negative real rates for for several years. We've had rates around zero for years before that. We've seen a real surge in real rates, and that is just not possible to maintain. In the leveraged economy that we're running today, both governments running $32 trillion of debt in the US, consumer balance sheets that are over levered, state balance sheets, provincial balance sheets are over levered. We, we need negative real rates and we need loose economic policy or inflationary policies to float this debt. And if we try too hard to contain that, we're going to have a recession. And if we try too hard to be loose and free up the economic activity, we're going to have massive inflation. So we're really, we talked, think three years ago, being trapped. The Fed is kind of trapped because they can't really raise rates, but they're going to have to. Well, now we're seeing that trap, you know, real time traps because your, your interest on your debt today at $32 trillion is yeah. $1.5 trillion a year of interest expense at a 5% coupon rate. Like that's, that's a staggering number. And so you really, these numbers are becoming real and the interest payments are becoming tangible. 
And how do you fund these interest payments? How do you keep your economy? How do you keep your personal balance sheet afloat in this environment? It becomes more and more difficult. So it's yeah. uh yeah. And when you look at like where could they go to make some cuts in order to finance uh these debt payments, you look at like maybe entitlements and defense spending, the only two buckets that would be realistic that could make a dent. Um, my thoughts healthcare. are that healthcare, yeah, okay. So, you know. Are those any feasible directions? When I think through it, I'm like, you can't cut entitlements. That's political suicide. They're not mm -hmm. going to cut defense spending. I expect that to go up because presently we're manufacturing a lot of our key systems overseas. We're trying to bring those home. That's going to increase the cost. Also, we're entering into some kind of a new Cold War, increasing the emphasis on defense competency. Do you see any options there, Michael? Any cuts that could be made to balance this? Polit politically, extremely difficult. And I, I see zero will. Uh, from, from any politician that I follow to actually take those steps. I mean, we had this experience, Jay, in the, Canada in the 90s. I mean, Canada, people forget, Canada almost hit the wall in the 90s, a period where our bond yields were surging two, three, 400 basis points above the U.S. comparable treasury yields because the market was concerned of Canada's solvency because our debt got really out of whack. And then the, the crunchy liberal, Paul Martin liberals came in and started the job to fiscal austerity and making those hard cuts. And the conservatives followed through and brought us back to balanced budgets. And, and, you know, that was a period of actually really good economic time for Canadians. Obviously, it's a very painful period. Nobody wants to do that because it's not popular. It's extremely politically difficult. The only times in my uh, life that I've seen politicians do that is when they're literally their backs are against the wall. When the bond market stops, starts to revolt and your yield starts spiking, like we saw in Europe in the 2014, mid 20 period, uh, when you see, a, or Argentina, places like that where you just, your bonds start blowing out, you have no choice but to make cuts. But until that time comes, very few politicians want to take the pain of doing that, even if it is the right thing to do. And you're right. Yeah. The interest on the U.S. debt currently is exceeding defense spending. I think it's exceeding healthcare spending. Like it's staggering. Just the interest on the debt is exceeding those three big buckets that you talked about. That That's scary. Because the interest, you can't, you can't make your debt go away unless you inflate it away. You can't cut those entitlement spending. So that's why I think inflation or you know dollar devaluation, however you want to call it, is here to stay because it's, it's the only politically attainable way to maintain those spending levels without causing a revolt, other than somebody coming in and saying we're going to take five, ten years of our pain and sacrifice and shared you know uh, sacrifice as a country to get our books back in order. It's very, very difficult to, for the people to do that. Okay, so I want to talk about you know where investors might look as a sound strategy for that scenario. Uh, I think I know where you might go. So before I get there, I just want to double back to um, the story you shared about, about uh, Canada's budget from the 90s through to the 2000s, you know, in, in a ton. It was, you know, we were more or less an insolvent country, got back to a balanced budget. And the conservative government that picked up where Chrétien left off was the Harper government. Uh, you know, they did balance the budget. He, you know, through 2008, they did run a deficit. Uh, then they corrected it. They did run stimulus. Then they ended it, right? And we actually came through the 2008 financial crisis uh, with a stronger balance sheet than any other G7, G8 nation. Um, we're absolutely not in that situation anymore. Do you think um, I am just pulling on fantasy to think that if the conservative leader, Pierre Poliev, takes office, he's the first conservative leader to have been endorsed by former Prime Minister Stephen Harper since he was in office. He's taken a pass on every leader since he was in office, but he's now endorsing uh, Poliev, you know, but I, I, and I'm, you know, I'll, I'll maybe leave it at that, but do you think he has the stones? Do you see any politicians with the stones now to, to do the hard thing, right? To sort of compromise their political career in exchange for improving the financial health of the country, it, both either yeah, in Canada or the US. Do you see that today? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I'll, I'll put the put, put, yeah, for a second on the side. I want to get to your question. You talked really nicely about, you know, the right time to run deficits as a, as a country is in periods like 2008. In periods of major financial distress, a total global economic meltdown, major economic recessions, as the government, you want to be spending counter cyclically. So when the economy is in contraction, that's when you use your balance sheet as a government to go out and, you know, buffer the economy. But what we did very smartly as a country in 2008 in Canada was once that buffer was used and the economy started to recover, we cut back on spending. We ran balanced budgets or surpluses to save for a rainy day. Same way my family, your family should be doing. When, when times are good, you should be putting money away for a rainy day. So when the hurricane or the tsunami hits your economically, your family, you have the financial means to survive. The big, big mistake we made post-2008 was we kept the stimulus going. We kept it going, kept it going. Rates went to zero. I remember Justin Trudeau's interview a couple of years ago saying, we have to borrow these hundreds of billions of dollars because rates are low. Why would we not borrow this money? Because we, it would be foolish not to use this gift 
to invest in Canadians' future. Well, guess what now? Rates have gone from zero to five or 6%. We doubled our debt in Canada for a period of five years. In the US, is very similar from Barack Obama to today. It was, I think, a tripling of the debt, 10, 10 trillion to $32 trillion. So we bought all this money when rates were cheap and we didn't really need to. And now what really scares me, Jay, is if the next economic tsunami hits us, which if we do have, a, if I am right, we do have a recession, both Canada and the US do not have the buffer that they had in 2008 or in previous years to invest counter cyclically. And that's the scary part. You've, you've spent all your bullets, you've leveraged your balance sheet in the good times. Now when yeah. the bad times hit, you have less tax revenues to pay off the interest and you have less balance sheet to invest in. So that's the first part of your question. The second, the good news is, I do think there is a lot of low hanging fruit, uh, both in the US and Canada for, for leaders that want to do pro business, free market, cut some of the fat in the government spending, unleash some of the productivity that's being withheld. I mean, when governments spend this much money, they drown out the economy, right? Like you're, you're drowning out the entrepreneurs by spending all this money. So I think there is room for a Polyev or for conservative governments in both countries to come in and improve things, but they are operating now with hands tied behind their back. The debt levels are so high and a pending recession, in my opinion, is so near. The job is much, much more difficult than it even was in 2008 or it was in Canada in the 90s because the, the mountain is higher to climb and the work that needs to be done is more significant, which means you're going to really have to have voters to come to understand that maybe the right thing for them is not promising them sunshine and rainbows, but promising them the hard truth and telling them we have to sacrifice the next five to 10 years as a, as a country, as citizens, to make sure that the next generation have a future, have an economic future that, that's as rosy as we did or my parents did, right? So yeah. That, but, it's, but most politicians don't want to talk to that because nobody wants to hear five years of hard times and shared sacrifice. They want to hear more government spending, more programs. The government has an answer for everything. That's not that's not the truth. And at a certain point, you run out of money, and then people find out the hard way that that is that is the hard truth. I publish a weekly newsletter every Sunday. If you would like to subscribe, hit the link right beneath this video. Now I'm an investor, but I don't write about managing money. I write about managing my mind. Without question, the hardest and most important part of allocating capital through volatility and getting some back. If you want to read my newsletter, hit the link right beneath this video. I know you'll love it. Now back to the interview. Enjoy. No. Yes. Oh, really well said, Michael, and thank you for that. I'm waiting for the candidate who gets to the podium and says, it's time to make Canada tough again. Let's do this. <laughs> Where's that? Where's that individual? Bring him out. Okay. So look, um, I want to talk about where you might be looking as an investor to hedge against. I, I agree with you. I, I see the same, what I believe to be leading indicators pointing towards some rougher times ahead. It's it's the right time to have something tucked away. Um, what can investors do today? And maybe I'll 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 preempt this question with sort of my thoughts on it and love your feedback on that. So yeah. I'm seeing a bit of a rotation, I believe, from the smartest money that I'm in touch with away from speculative tech stocks over this over the last two years towards more raw materials, mainly the commodity mm -hmm. sector. And yeah. we, you touched on this earlier. It doesn't really matter where you look, copper, nickel, oil, natural gas, these have been starved of capital for you know, 10, 15 years now. Um, demand's going up. How do you uh, reconcile that with a weak economic outlook though, right? Which typically yeah. depresses demand for key commodities. What do you think about that? Yeah, so I would say in it, if you follow the thesis of my logic so far, I'm looking for kind of a stagflationary environment where the economy is going to be softening and the governments are going to be forced to de-dollarize or inflate their currencies away to to cover their cost of living. The living governments are living above their means, so they're going to have to print their money, print the money to to live at these level of standard living for longer, right? So in that situation, if you believe in a more inflationary or stagflation environment, which I do with constrained interest rates because you cannot afford to raise rates any higher, then hard assets should do very well. Or hard assets will at least protect your standard of living much more than a speculative tech stock will do in that kind of environment, right? So I am predisposed to hard assets. But your question is a good one. I've covered base metals, oil and gas, all the commodities for 20 plus years. And typically they don't do very well in a recessionary environment. So I do have some pause when it comes to the economically sensitive metals. At the same time, the underinvestment has been so dramatic you're seeing copper, right? We, we had a huge fears of recession for all of 2023, most 2022. Yet copper never really broke down above 350 a pound. In previous years, you would have had copper at two bucks, but it got completely crushed because people say, here's a recession, I'm going to sell my copper. Same thing for oil. Oil sold off, but it's held in very, very well. So those commodities are telling you that we have a dramatic shortages in them and that probably the US dollar is slowly eroding as its eminent position in the global financial markets. So those hard assets will protect value. My, my top place to invest, Jay, under my current scenario is actually gold because okay. gold does well in a recessionary environment. 
it does extremely well in an inflationary environment or a you know the loss of fiat currency purchasing power type environment. And also it's extremely out of favor right now. It's not this gold stocks and the sector is not well appreciated by institutional investors. So in terms of a fund flow perspective, there's a lot of money that can flow from speculative tech into gold that that trade is extremely early in its, in its infancy. So I like that trade. Uh, I like copper because I think there's going to be very, there's not enough of the copper and the battery metals to do this green transition that our politicians are trying to pull off. So I think we're going to have massive shortages. I'm, I'm in the weeds on these junior explorers and developers. Building a mine is extremely difficult. And these politicians are building spreadsheets at their big fancy conferences and they don't understand how hard it is to build a mine. And therefore their projections for copper, nickel and base metal supply to meet this demand is, is completely off. And we're going to be dramatically short those metals. But, and I'm very bullish on oil because we have not, we've been systematically attacking the oil industry for the last 10 years. You've, you've cut off the capital supply to it. You've made it a prior industry. Major funds can no longer invest in oil. So the industry is capital starved and politicians are, are basically sitting every single day. We don't want oil. We don't want oil. We don't want oil. But guess what, Jay? The world needs oil, a lot of it. And so supply has been dramatically curtailed. I think demand is going to be stronger. And I think the EV revolution is going to be a lot slower than people think. So demand is going to hang in longer. So yeah, I'd say copper, gold, oil, they're all good places to look. And they should benefit from the tail ones we talked about today in terms of the inflationary pressures persisting in the economy. I'd, I'd love you, Michael, to follow that up with uh, your time horizon. I think that's really important. As you're walking through this, I was like, I, I need to make sure people are aware of your time horizon right now. Um, because most of my audience, long-term value investors, that's what yeah. I am. That's who consumes this show. But you know, that means something different to everybody, right? And a lot of people... Uh, over the last three years have become investors and have mistakenly viewed the market as a get rich quick scheme. You know, you just pick the right meme stock and you can make away like a bandit. Um, duration, in my experience, is the one competitive advantage that we can all have. And that's where real wealth is made. Talk to me about your time horizon when you think through your dire economic outlook, but copper industry is starved of capital. You're parking cash there because hard assets tend to preserve your purchasing power. And over what time yeah. period do you, you tend to focus? Yeah. So, you know, my own personal capital, I'm, I'm like a three to 10 year time horizon. So I have a very long yeah. term horizon. Uh, I tend to be contrarian. So when you're contrarian, you have to be patient by nature, Jay, because you're probably a couple of years early on those trades. It always takes a bit longer when you're contrarian for the market to wake up. To give you an example, I started investing very heavily in gold in late 2018, early 2019. So gold was $1,300 an ounce. You can go back to my past interviews on YouTube. And my macro thesis is almost exactly what it was today. And the thesis has played out really well. And it's continues to play out very, very well from a macro perspective. The gold price has gone from $1,300 to $1,900 an ounce in that, in that kind of period. Yet in general, the stocks haven't yet to respond. But the way I look at things is I have a thesis for kind of three to 10 year view on, a, on an investment that I'm looking to make. And I'm constantly checking my thesis. Is there something that's changed to alter my thesis? My thesis is no longer valid. Was I, was I wrong about that investment thesis? When I look at gold, all the boxes that have been ticked continue to be ticked for a very, very positive outlook. Yet the stocks have not responded yet. So I remain extremely heavily invested in that sector and extremely bullish because my thesis is intact. And in fact, the macro is unfolding exactly as I thought. Investors have yet to kind of flow into that trade, but they'll come. I'm confident in that. So when your investors hear people like me talking, like it's not go out and buy stock XYZ tomorrow and expect to make money by Friday. It's if the idea is you're positioning yourself for certain trends, you're looking for great value, and you're hoping to make three, four, five, ten times your money if you're right and you're patient. A lot of investors get involved today. So you have that, you know, Jay makes a lot of sense. Mike makes a lot of sense. Let's let's buy some gold stocks and they lose money tomorrow and they're like, they're out by Friday. You know, and that's, that's not that's not yeah, how you yeah. make money in the market, right? So you've got to have the the fortitude to hang in there, the thesis, the conviction and patience. You know, you, you remember Michael Burry in the big short wearing the death metal headphones kind of, he knew he was right, uh, but he had to wait and wait and wait for the market to, to realize the facts that he had uncovered first. He had to be patient and he had to be able to lose money while he waited for his thesis to play out. And that's often investors don't have that fortitude. They want to get paid right away and therefore they chase winners. And that's why the magnificent seven tech stocks are making new all-time highs every single day is because you get instant gratification there, right? And you have that validation to, to make money and your peers own the stocks. So it's not easy to be contrarian, yeah. but, but that's how you make a significant capital in the market. It, it is. And, you know, in terms of the magnificent seven, I think those prices are often like, you know, um, What's the term? Self fulfilling. You know, investors are just chasing yeah. higher feedback prices. Loop. Yeah, it's a feedback, feedback loop. Yes, and then you, eventually you buy it, it goes up. You feel smart. Your neighbor buys it. He feels smart. She feels smart. And it goes on and on until until it stops. And then it's, it's an extreme stops. case of, of these, you know, pyramiding stocks 
I mean, these P multiples have almost doubled in the last two years and the, the earnings growth, the revenue growth, these companies decelerated dramatically. It's very rarely you see that, but they're all parking their money in the same names. Yeah. And I, I really appreciated your stance. And like, as you said, investor fortitude, having conviction in your time horizon gives you that fortitude to withstand the short-term volatility, right? And as, yeah. as you mentioned, and, um, you know, in my newsletter, I talk about some companies that I own. And I always add the caveat. I say that, yes, I actually injected some more capital into a couple names here. That does not mean I'm expecting them to take off this or next quarter. That's not what I'm saying, right? But I'm parking cash right here because nobody else is. I can walk into, and I'm I'm talking about some sort of mid-tier gold producers. That's where I'm putting a lot of cash right now because I can walk in with no competition. No, yeah. you know, everybody hates that sector right now. Great companies with management who have, you know, hit it out of the park two or three times. Great track record. And success typically begets success, but the market doesn't care right now. Exactly. exactly uh, right. Okay. Very cool. Um, uh, how do you how do you break down your your risk management when you're looking at um, the commodity sector, Michael? Anything you'd share with my audience about? You know, we've got a lot of new viewers to the channel who are now looking at the commodity sector. Um, I think their timing is really good. But what kind of counsel would you provide to somebody who's been an investor for maybe five five plus years, but they're just starting to look at commodities over the last year or so? How would you? Yeah, I mean, look, there's lots, of, lots of ways to. I've learned over my over the years. You learn a lot by how from losing money than you do from making money. So there's a lot of ways to lose money, and you learn every time why you've lost money. I'd say in the commodity sector, a few things on a high level. Before you invest in a commodity, if you buy a stock, if you buy an oil stock, it sounds simple. You buy an oil stock, a gold stock, a copper stock. Right, ninety percent of your return is going to be tied to is oil, copper, or gold going up or down that month. So that's the first thing. So before you invest in a commodity. Spend the time to understand the commodity. Spend the time to understand the dynamics, the macro backdrop for that economy, that commodity, like it did in gold in 2019. Do you think gold is going to go up or down and why? So have, have, a, have a view on the commodity. I prefer in commodities to be counter cyclical or contrarian. So I like to buy, I really love a setup where I'm buying a commodity where I like it and everybody else hates it. That's a really amazing setup for two reasons. One, if you're right, the commodity should go up a lot. So you can have a tailwind behind the stocks that you buy for, for several years. Two, when everybody hates a commodity, typically the stocks are trading at fire sale valuations. So let's say when gold was $1,300 an ounce, they were pricing at $1,000 gold because people just hated the, the gold sector. So you're getting a stock that's pricing in a commodity that's even lower priced than where the commodity is trading today, which is already a very low priced commodity, if that makes sense in terms of the logic, right? So yep. get, your, yep. get your basis set on the commodity. I prefer buying things that people don't like that I think is going to go up versus, let's say, lithium or something that's like red hot right now. Yes, you'll make money faster. It feels really good, but the lithium price went up, I think, 10x from the previous peak in 2017, right? I'm like, maybe it's going to go higher. I get, I get the macro backdrop. It's fantastic, but you're you're playing with fire there. At some point, the commodity is a little overextended. It's going to pull back. You're probably going to lose money. I'd much rather be in a commodity where I have a view that no one else does. That's how you're going to do well. But again, you have to do the work. You got to have the fortitude. You got to have the confidence to, to buy something. And then once you get into the stocks, there's lots of advice that I could share. It's probably a whole separate interview. We could talk about the how to, to not lose money, but you know, balance sheet's important. And if you're buying commodities that are out of favor, do they have the cash on the balance sheet or the cash flow to sustain themselves, or do they need capital markets? So, you know, if they can they fund themselves internally or they need external capital. If they need external capital, check out the dilution, make sure they're not gonna have to do a desperate financing at some point in time. I mean, jurisdiction is important. So if they're a producer, where are they producing in the security of, of the economic uh, rule or law in that country? What are their cash costs? What are their margins? You know, you want to be a lower cost producer if possible because you can sustain yourself throughout the whole cycle. Uh, and obviously valuation. I mean, valuation is very important, right? So if you're getting a, a quality name at a, at a really low valuation and a good jurisdiction, it's rare you can find that. But in, in downturns or bear markets, like you see in the gold sector, you can find names like that that tick all the boxes, yet you're not paying a premium for it. But I, that's a topic of passion. We'd be happy to have a longer session with you on, on what I look for, but it, it is something that, Investors should just not be like, hey, I like copper. Let me just go buy stock X, Y, Z. It yeah. is worth spending some time to educate themselves. And people like yourselves are doing a great job helping investors get educated to learn and, and, and make smart decisions with their capital. Well, I like how you start with the, the macro and the commodity itself, right? So you're looking at the equities. You're looking at copper, explorers, developers, gold producers. Um, maybe, I'm not sure if you're looking at explorers, uh, producers, developers, you know, but, but, but that gamut, right, of company. But starting with the commodity itself, you know, are you forecasting a headwind or a tailwind? And then you marry you marry that with investor sentiment. You talked about lithium, right? Lithium might be in huge demand uh, for the next 30 years and eventually in short supply. But, you know, 
marry that with investor sentiment. It's maybe overbought right now. It doesn't mean it's always a good bet. It's not always a good time to buy something, even if there is a tailwind. Um, and you, you made a comment about, you know, the probability of a company having to finance and you want to be aware of that. And especially, right, I, I don't know when the market is so out of favor for a lot of these resource companies, the most scarce resource is actually cash and their ability to get it when they need it, right? And so, yeah, having a thorough understanding of their the company's ability to raise cash on decent terms and when they're going to have to do that, uh, vitally, vitally important, especially when the market's a bit illiquid as it is right now. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, I always tell companies I'm working with, you know, raise money when you don't need it. Yeah. If you, well, yeah. If you have the money, you get, raise more because when you do need the money and the markets are tough, it's going to be extremely expensive and extremely painful to raise capital and very painful to the existing shareholders who have to eat that dilution. So a lot of companies have, especially the exploration sector, which I'm actually quite actively involved in, they yeah. have this model of raise money, spend money. When I run out of money, I go back to the market and raise money again. Well, the market sees you coming a mile away. If you're going to the market hat in hand with $100,000 in the bank, your stock's going straight down to do financing. So I tell companies, if you got $5 million in the bank and someone offers you another five, take that five. So you don't have to raise money for several years and investors are forced to buy your stock in the market. But many companies just operate in that spend, raise, spend, raise model. That's why a lot of these stocks you know, struggle to, to generate returns for their investors because they're constantly raising capital at the wrong times on disadvantageous terms for their shareholders. Sounds like the Canadian government borrowing money at the wrong time. It's very, very similar philosophy. Luckily, they can uh, print money though, Jay. <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I right, look, Michael. It's been uh, been a pleasure chatting to you. I would like to do a follow up episode, actually specific to analyzing the equities market and you know how you police your own emotions and and uh, get to the no. I often say like it's. It's easy to get to a yes, but what you want to do is get to the no. Like, how do you disqualify those opportunities that probably aren't worth your time or aren't the best case scenario? Um, and then, you know, you get down to a small, small pool, right? That you can then make a serious yeah. fall on. But uh, I'd love to do a follow-up piece with you on that topic. That'd be um, a lot of fun. Yeah. And in the meantime, thanks for coming on today. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks, Jay. Thank you for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Now, if you want to take the next step, I publish a weekly newsletter and it's free. There's a link to subscribe right beneath this video and you can join me and 50,000 other investors weekly for this exclusive content where I share my key action items and takeaways from conversations just like this and plenty others. Thanks for stopping by.